the Magnum Stewart Associate Professor of History. I'm also affiliated with the Women and Gender Studies program. I welcome you to fall 2015 Magnum Stewart uh, lecture in Women in the Developing World. Uh, I'll introduce the guest, our guest who is a distinguished scholar of Islam, but before that I really want to emphasize that I'm, I'm, I really appreciate that you all showed up. I know that this is the end of the term, we are all very busy, and this is a location that's not the most convenient, but it shows that there is enough interest at MIT on topics that pertain to Islam, difference, sexual and religious difference, at this important time where, unfortunately, all of us are expected to have more knowledge about. But it, I, always, I almost feel like it's our citizenship duty to know more, and we have this great opportunity to pause and think about these uh, questions. Do I need it? Okay. Um, so we are very fortunate to have Anwar Iman with us today. He's a leading scholar of Islamic law uh, who works across multiple legal traditions. He's a professor of law at the University of Toronto where he holds the Canada Research Chair in Religion, Pluralism and the Rule of Law. He's a lawyer and also a historian at the same time. Uh, he, is, he has a JD from UCLA School of Law, then MA from the University of Texas, Austin, then an LLM from Yale School of Law, then a PhD at UCLA from the Department of History, and then a JSD from Yale Law School, um, where he graduated in 2009. He's a prolific researcher and brings he, his uh, expertise regularly to the world of governments. He's consulted by the government, uh, um, NGOs, uh, legal, act, legal uh, advocacy groups. He has, I'm, I'm going to try to uh, summarize the CV just so that you have an idea of uh, who he is, I will mention just one article, the one that I assign in my courses, um, in my Women and Gender in the Middle East and North Africa course. This is titled, The Paradox of Equality and the Politics of Difference, Gender Equality, Islamic Law, and the Modern Muslim State, which appeared in a co-edited volume in 2013 um, um, that was published by I.B. Torres. Um, he has four books two of them that he published really within the last five years. Uh, they are all from Oxford University Press. The first one uh, is, is, is titled Islamic Natural Law Theories. The second one is, this is the one that I'm most familiar with and this is the one, honestly, is the reason why I wanted to have him here talk us uh, substantially about the, about the content of his work. The book is titled Religious Pluralism and Islamic Law, The Me's and Others in the Empire of Law, Oxford University Press 2012. So he also co-edited a book in 2012 titled Islamic Law and International Human Rights Law, Searching for Common Ground. Um, He's also, maybe he's going to mention them, but he has been at work in, um, in collaborating for various different projects. He is the founding editor of Middle East Law and Governance, an interdisciplinary journal, and the editor of the Islamic, uh, Oxford Islamic Legal um, Studies. So today's talk is titled, uh, Why Tolerance Misses the Point, I guess. I, uh, sorry. Um, the legality of religious and sexual difference in Islamic law. So, I, I, the floor is yours. Thank you for being here. Thank you very much. It's, I, will, I have this. I got it to you. Thank you. So I. Um, oh no, no worries. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Leonard, for that lovely introduction. Uh, I think the one thing you can take away from it is that I was in school for a very long time. Uh, and I'm, in a sense, still in school now that I'm just on the other side of the podium. Uh, but I still am constantly learning from students and, 
and colleagues all the time. I want to first begin by thanking the MIT community, the gender, the gender studies program, um, the Macmillan Stewart family uh, that makes this, uh, makes this lecture possible, and to, of course, all of you who are here today. Some of you are friends I've known for many years who've made a trek. Some of you as far from Vancouver, though really by way of Boston, uh, uh, residing here for the year, but others are uh, newer friends that I'm, I'm delighted to meet. So uh, thank you all very much for being here, especially at the end of year when all of you really should be studying for finals. So shame on you. Uh, uh, I want to start with a bit of an outline of what my talk will be, be about. I've, uh, I've, I've tried to blend uh, a combination of things. My past work, my most present work that I'm in the middle of dealing with and advocating, as well as future work I'm designing and gesturing to at various points. So in some ways, this talk is utterly responsible because it reflects uh, considered reflection thinking with, uh, with pages of footnotes I could provide to you upon request if you want. Um, on the other hand, it's completely irresponsible in that I'm reflecting on things that I really have no reason to reflect about, but they're curious uh, and uh, they're curiosities for me and I'm hoping that maybe you will tell me where I'm wrong, uh, where I'm right, hopefully I'm right, I think I'm right, I probably am right. Um, but needless to say, I, those are, that's one of my disclaimers. The other thing is I want to also qualify the title. Uh, you know, I, I, I'm sort of poo-pooing tolerance, why tolerance misses the point, and I don't want to downplay tolerance, right? I mean, I think that it would be nice to have just mere tolerance sometimes. I think after the events of Paris, mere tolerance might actually be a nice thing. Uh, and so I don't want to, to poo-poo the idea of tolerance, but what I want to do in this talk is actually think about what the language of tolerance, or what I call tolerance talk vis-a-vis -vis Islam, is actually doing, what it's hiding, what it's a proxy for, and perhaps if we put aside the, the tolerance talk and instead look at what it's a proxy for, we might actually have different insights into what both Islamic law is doing in certain instances, but also what it can do for us intellectually as we in the North Atlantic think about it both as we imagine our own selves legally, politically, but also as we try to understand an other, in this case, the Muslim other. So um, my talk is divided, and, and part of what I'm hoping to do in thinking about this gesture in Islamic law or gesture towards a more critical dialogue on Islamic law is also to think about beyond the scholarly realm into applied realms. I'm a lawyer, I work in a law faculty, and so I can't help but think about governance. Um, I, and so as much as I do revel I think I just turned something off. Sorry. Uh, as much as I revel, <clears throat> let me just get this right, and I might need our friend over there to, is it back? Can you check, or did I do something? I know I did something wrong. Play from current slide. Is it there? It's coming, ah, oh, wow. That was the most technological I've ever been in my life. But, <laughs> Performance anxiety was great over there. Okay, uh, so what I want to what I want to suggest though is um, I, I I can't help but think about applications, policy implications, or whatnot, which is not what you know a really good humanities social science scholar necessarily would do. Well, they hopefully would. I think we all think about these things, but in the world of law, because with the way law schools are placed, we are in a sense in the university. Uh, working with students, but we're not necessarily of the university. You'll notice most law schools are on the periphery physically of most universities. We're professional schools, we train lawyers to practice law, and that sometimes often is where my mind goes. And so um, I apologize if that is, uh, well, I'm not gonna apologize for it, but it is where I, I want us to go. So there's three parts to my talk. The first one is I wanna examine tolerance, uh, tolerance talk about Islamic law and its conceptual limits. That'll be the first part of the talk. It'll take the majority of sort of the, this is where I'm, I'm heavily footnoted in my analysis. The second part is I wanna start thinking about Islamic law as a vehicle of critique of North Atlantic academic paradigms, and particularly legal paradigms. And this is where I'm, I'm gesturing to ideas that I wanna play with in, with respect to, the, to, to all of us together. And then the third part is I wanna then think about if we adopt Islamic law as a vehicle of critique not just of the Muslim world, but also of our own paradigms of thinking about the Muslim world, what might be some of the kinds of implications we could see, particularly when we think about Islamic law 
and the modern state and questions of governance. And so what I want to start with now in part one is tolerance talk and the Islamic law on Vimy's. Now, the Islamic law on Vimy's is my vehicle of thinking about where tolerance talk uh, occurs. But let's first, before I get to what the Vimy is and what that Arabic term refers to, let's, let's first situate tolerance talk itself. Um, uh, in 2010, the Center for Security Policy in, 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 in Washington, D.C. issued a report, Sharia, the next threat to America, the plan B2, the Team B2 report. It was a takeoff of an earlier version of this regarding communism. And the argument of this policy, no, notably by a number of well-respected and well-known neocons, um, so maybe those of us on the left wouldn't say well-respected, but certainly neocons, um, uh, is, is that in, in a context, in a post-9-11 context, where certainly it's very hard to identify where Al-Qaeda is, and at that time we were worried about Al-Qaeda. Uh, how do I identify the enemy? And what's the vehicle by which we identify the enemy? And the argument of the report was that, well, the enemy is the, is, is, is the one who identifies and adheres to Sharia. Why? Well, Sharia provides the doctrines of our enemy that justifies and legitimates its attack against us. And so we need to, on the one hand, understand our enemy's rhetoric and the logic of our rhetoric, which is completely understandable in one sense. But then they go so far as to say, and thereby to understand its rhetoric and its logic means that anyone, including Americans, who ascribe to Sharia writ large, they didn't really s d d d define it in more limited ways, anyone who identifies with Sharia, adheres to it, is a, put as a presumptive enemy to us. And so they, they began to use Sharia as a pretext for thinking about the Muslim next door. And from this, you begin to see within a year, one of the co-authors of that report, David Yerushalmi, also had a website where he had draft legislation for US states that presumed to ban Islamic law. It was a, a provision that would be usually annexed within uh, codes of judicial procedure about whether judges can or cannot hear foreign law. And we'll get to this foreign law notion towards the end of, uh, end of uh, the, the lecture. I was, uh, I was about to say end of class, and I apologize for that. Uh, but at the end of the lecture, but what's interesting is that this foreign law notion becomes the, the vehicle by which you see a whole plethora of, of law and legislation, uh, a kind of legislative theater, so to speak, in 2011, where legislators around the country in states are trying to tell their local judiciary when not to invoke Islamic law. You see, for instance, the Oklahoma Amendment, the Save Our State Amendment, that tried to ban Sharia and international law. You saw uh, Arizona trying to ban Islamic law and karma, which nobody really should ever try to ban karma. I mean, we know what happens. I mean, really, we know what karma is. Let's just move, let's not touch karma, right? Touch Islamic law, but just not karma, right? Um, so. What, and, but, and ultimately what you see is a piece of le the legislation that has passed various states is in fact uh, a legislation that precludes judges from uh, invoking foreign law if it doesn't provide the same protections and legal rights as American law. And we'll talk a little bit about why that's redundant later on and actually kind of in unnecessary. So it's in the context of this concern about Sharia, the Muslim next door, that the, 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 the location of this concern is of course in the language of jihad, and jihad then provides the vehicle for a security center, a center on security to then think about how to protect our borders. But within the jihad discourse in Islamic law is also what you do with the non-Muslim, particularly the non-Muslim who doesn't fight and resides within the Muslim territory. And this is the dhimmi. And so when we think about the Vimy, the Vimy is, and historically was imagined by Muslim jurists to be the permanent non-Muslim resident in Muslim lands. So in a context of conquest, uh, the doctrine would go that you, the Muslim army, would give your opponents three options. One is to convert to Islam. Uh, if they don't do that, then they can pay a poll tax, the jizya, and they can retain their faith and live under the suzerainty of the Islamic regime. That would be the Vimy. Or the third is to be fought and conquered and then treated as spoils of war. Um, you can see this particular doctrine even in, in the doctrines of ISIS. Now, you probably can't see this from over there, and 
even if you can, you might not necessarily know the Arabic. But this is um, when, 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 when ISIS took over Raqqa province in Syria, they issued this declaration about, about the Christians of, of Raqqa. And what's interesting is when you look at this, and, and, and I can provide a copy of this for anyone who wants it, they're actually invoking the language of the Dhimmi and imposing the poll tax on them. And there's actually, um, there's actually a provision here that translates the currency, so if for instance you were supposed to pay in medieval periods, let's say one or two gold coins, gold dinars, they somehow translate it into current foreign currency exchange ratios and give you, I think, contemporary Syrian dollar values of it, which is fascinating financial math, but, um, <laughs> but which, you know, currency always has the ability to, to, to transfer. Who knew that it could transfer this well? Um, but what, what's interesting is that this medieval tradition, this medieval language um, that we find in the historical sources becomes constitutive of the way ISIS performs itself as a governing regime in, in the context of diversity or difference. And so it's, it's things like this that have begged a whole host of questions. Um, is Islam tolerant of the religious other? Is Islamic law tolerant of the religious other? Are Muslims who adhere to Sharia tolerant of the religious other? Uh, and this language of tolerance mirrors the peace talk. So is Islam a religion of peace or violence, for instance? Is another version of the same kind of language and concern, or at least it reflects the same kinds of concern, though the tolerance language tends to track the dhimmi rules more precisely than perhaps the, the peace talk. So, um, one of the things I want to then think about is at the heart of the tolerance debate and tolerance talk is a concern about the dhimmi. And so I want to front, front in this conversation the dhimmi itself. What are the dhimmi rules? And so we'll talk about it. But these dhimmi rules are part of a, of a genre of literature in early Islam in Islamic law called fiqh. Fiqh um, being, and they, they range, and those of you who know enough about the field will know that they come in short and large volumes. Um, lawyers might, might ap appreciate an analogy to the restatements of the American Law Institute, the Corpus Juris Secundum, their encyclopedic statements of what the law ought to be in a certain context, not always what the law is, because they're not speaking as if they were government officials, they're often writing outside the context of governance, but they're writing to implicitly governance on the one hand, or they might also be writing to themselves. And so this genre of literature, of legal literature, is curious because how, what do you do with it? On the one hand, it's not in place like a statute, right? Or a, a, a judicial decision, which we know has is in response to a case in controversy. You can read a common law decision and you can gather from it a set of facts about the parties in dispute. That's not what fiqh is about. Uh, but it doesn't read like a code either because it's far too variegated. And it certainly isn't unified or uniform like a code, whether in the civilian tradition or modern legislation. So what exactly is it? Is it it's not, is it theory? Well, it's not only theory in terms of legal theory. It's certainly doctrinal in a positivist fashion. Um, is it a window into social history? Or is it just simply, or is it something else? And I, I wanna reflect on a, on a colleague and a friend of mine, Tamu Ruscola of Emory Law Faculty, he writes in the context of China and Chinese law, but particularly the reception of China in the imagination of the American legal establishment, when he writes in his book, Legal Orientalism, that one, one way to imagine or understand this particular genre is a kind of epistemic practice that if, you, if, if you're looking for a way to historically situate this diachronically extensive literature, you can see it as a practice of a juristic class as they explore the implications of the legal epistemology. And so to explore the fiqh genre in, in detail, sometimes nauseating detail, well, not nauseating for me, maybe for you, um, but nauseating nonetheless, is, is in fact an, an attempt to try to unpack the epistemological assumptions that make the legal logic possible, that actually are the conditions for legality to begin with. So I wanna suggest through part one that a close reading of the fiqh might reveal the assumptions that make the epistemic practice of writing law and legal doctrine possible. And more specifically, how do the rules in the dhimmi are sites of difference in the law? So there's a recognition of difference. How does that difference become turned into something that's legally relevant? Not in a way that we would say is meant to be discriminatory as a matter of law, 
but is meant to differentiate. So if you think of equality jurisprudence, uh, difference and equality, we often might say, well, how do we, how do we differentiate without discriminating? But we always do that. Like we have a men's bathroom and a women's bathroom. They're two very different ones. They only become a problem if you're transsexual, for instance, if you're in between. Um, they might only become a problem if they don't provide access to, to, for, for disabled individuals. You might say a disabled bathroom or a disabled washroom provides uh, an undue reallocation of assets to a, to a certain class to the detriment of able-bodied individuals. Or, and so you might say you're discriminating against the able-bodied uh, in a formal equality sense. But what I want to suggest is that a substantive equality notion actually has to take difference into account. And this is the article that, that Professor Lerner was suggesting, was, was referring to, is that the paradox of equality is that actually difference matters. You have to treat people differently pursuant to certain circumstances. The question for us, though, is when do certain differences become so natural that they take on legal significance so that yes, of course, we have a men's bathroom and a woman's bathroom, and no one thinks of that as discriminatory, or at least I don't think of that as discriminatory, but uh, at least not in the narrow context of thinking about men and women accessing a washroom. But when does it become discriminatory? When does a natural dis distinction, a natural difference that's given uh, normative significance actually become discriminatory? I'm interested in the movement from one to the other. How do you get there? What, what are the conditions that make the move shift? Um, and so if we think about the Vimy rules, on the one hand, we see them as we interpret them, and they're often cast today as signals of an inherent Islamic intolerance for the religious other. And in certainly that's part of the historiography of the Islamic uh, legal scholarship, and certainly scholarship on this issue. Islam is inherently intolerant, footnote the Vimy rules. But others would say, well, wait a minute, no, because these fiqh rules are in an abstract category where they're not really aspects of social history, and in fact, they were oftentimes not even applied, they were mere academic exercises by jurists who were just sitting in their ivory tower. Um, and there are others who write, and I think the the uh, Najwa Katan wrote this seminal piece in Ijmis a number of years ago where she tries to track the application of the Dhimmi rules to non-Muslim litigants and, and says that even with these rules in place, the judges didn't actually, and there was no sense in which the outcome was dependent upon religious difference. So she says that the rules don't actually disadvantage non-Muslim litigants in court. But all of these arguments within the historiography take the rules as on their face value as black letter rules without actually questioning the logic underlying them. And I want to see how, what happens if you go beyond. And I'm thinking here of Wendy Brown. Wendy Brown uh, of UC Berkeley, her, her book Regulating Aversion, uh, was one among a series of, of, of uh, theoretical reflections on the notion of tolerance. And, and, and actually she's it was actually reading her book that helped me think about the Vimy rules not as, uh, as about either the tolerance or intolerance of Islam, but rather the mechanism by which difference is regulated. It was also living in Canada that helped me see that as well. In Canada, when I arrived in Canada in 2005, it was in the middle of what was the then notorious Sharia arbitration debate. And I, as, uh, as, as completely novice, thought, oh, I should say something about this. I am the Islamic law professor at the law faculty without at all understanding the political context of Ontario or Canada. So really, American hubris at its worst at that time. Um, <clears throat> but what was important for me in that hubristic moment was to encounter the language of multiculturalism, the way in which multiculturalism becomes a regulating label for difference in a country like Canada that prides itself on its not melting pot, but mosaic. And so how do you, in a sense, maintain difference and live with difference and see difference as constitutive as opposed to a, a vehicle by which one thinks about assimilation, for instance, or integration? Uh, so it was this combination of reading Wendy Brown, living in Canada, being involved in these debates that, that helped me to think about the Vimy rules as 
regulating difference, regulating diversity in a complex polity, and it allowed me to think about them as vehicles for managing minorities, diversities, as a governance problem. And, and as a governance problem, it forced me to think about, well, in a governance problem, we're thinking about allocations of resources, we're thinking about tax, we're talking about redistribution. To what extent does this difference matter in both the protection the state or the governing regime provides to minorities, like the non-Muslim living in Muslim lands, um, but also what kinds of protections does it not enjoy? How does the certain protections it does get also uh, re-emphasize their otherness. And uh, you certainly see that in the context of, for instance, in Ontario, where a historical, uh, a historical agreement enshrines French, uh, French the, the, the Catholic school board, uh, even though despite Quebec sort of moving away from religion and towards laicite, but to what extent does this grant of funding public expenditure for the Catholic school board in France on the one hand, it doesn't really play into the, light, the, the secularity of the government, but it also creates a structural commitment to a particular community that's not allowed or extended to other communities in the same way. And so you see how minorities, in a sense, can play off each other, but also um, achieve different kinds of treatment under the law. My point, of course, being that this is not exactly a, a peculiar issue to Islamic law. So if we look at the, the, the rules themselves, the ones that I'm interested in, and the ones I'll just review as a, just as, as examples here, is again, thinking about the sources. I'm mostly thinking about Sunni sources from the 10th to 15th century, the so-called classical period. Uh, they're all Arabic sources, so I did not look into Urdu or Persian. But again, these examples are meant to illustrate a dynamic that I wanna think about beyond. So just to, just to make sure we're all on the same page, um, a Muslim polity expands into a region of, uh, that's populated by non-Muslims, and that community of non-Muslims decides it doesn't want to convert to Islam. They adopt, they opt for the option to, uh, to, to pay the poll tax and enter what's called the contract of protection, the Akta Dhimma. The Akta Dhimma is a contract. Now, it's not that everyone is signing a contract. It is like a social contract, one that everyone is presumed to enter. And the contract, or the idea of the contract as a political device of inclusion, a political device defined by jurists, uh, to mind you, uh, is the site by which they're trying to figure out, the jurists are trying to figure out, what are the terms of this contract? One term of the contract, of course, a condition, uh, a condition sine qua non is, of course, that the non-Muslim pays the poll tax. The poll tax is a payment, a special tax that the non-Muslim pays to enter into the contract of protection and, in a sense, to literally buy into the polity, to buy into society. And the argument then is upon paying the poll tax, the contract of protection applies, and the contract means that the non-Muslim is protected in body and property in the same way that the, non, that the Muslim is protected in body and property. The question though is what is the scope of that? How exactly does that play out? And what I want to, when one reviews the rules themselves, you actually see really varying strategies. Uh, you see jurists try to be accommodative of, of minority interests. You see them also subjecting minority interests to larger public order considerations that trump the interests of those, of those specific communities. You see the language of security and securitization pop up as minorities are seen as a potential threat to that public order. And you do see the language of subordination. It's never one or the other, it's all of them at the same time. So for example, let's ask about alcohol. Can a non-Muslim consume alcohol in an Islamic polity? Now if any of you been to, du uh, anyone been to Abu Dhabi or Dubai? So can they? Over there, yes, yeah, totally, right? Go to any hotel. I was actually in Dubai, and it was kind of surreal. I was in, I was in the hotel lobby, massive bar, floor-to-ceiling alcohol bottles, and then there's a wedding party with the woman wearing a, a wedding dress with a niqab over it. It was really kind of, it was a, it was, I wish I had had a photo, because it was, it was just a great moment of, 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 of incoherence, which was great, or inconsistency at least. But um, so the, the, the general rule is that a non-Muslim is protected by their contract of protection. And the contract of protection means that they are upheld, that their traditions and their traditions requirements and, and allowances and licenses are permitted. So if the non-Muslim's religious tradition allows them to drink, then on the grounds of contract of protection, 
they too are allowed to drink. So for those of you interested in let's say, freedom of religion and the rights discourse, this is not a rights argument. This is a derivative argument from contract. The contract provides entree into society and derivative of the contract is a protection of a certain scope of liberty and freedom. But this isn't a liberal argument, right? It's a contractual argument. So alcohol consumption is allowed, great. But, so, wait, so that would be an example of accommodation. However, public order comes in and say, well, wait a minute, but there is this rule against consumption of alcohol. In fact, it's pretty strict in the Quranic text. And jurists say, well, what do I do with that? What do I do? What's the scope of that? Does that very specific rule, do I give it a narrow interpretation on its face? Or can I use it as a vehicle for expanding its application and its import? Does it have what some might call a penumbra of application? And some in, in law, um, penumbra is this odd word, so I, I hope you don't use it for that because it's a strange word. Um, but, um, but the idea then is, that, well, maybe it does have a penumbra. Maybe I can infer from this very expressed language of a rule a more general prohibition concerning the public order of society. And so what you find is that though the dhimmi can consume alcohol, they can't do so in public to the point of getting drunk. So you have a public policy imperative inferred from a general rule, don't consume alcohol, that informs a secondary derivative rule, you can't get drunk in public. But what that public is is never quite clear. What defines the public? The argument is we must, present, we must preserve the Islamicity of the public, the public space. But what does that mean in terms of what is the Islamicity of it and what is the public space itself? Never defined, always presumed. So, Again, a public order exception. So that's one. Then you have a kind of subordination. Now, I don't know if this is subordination. I use subordination as a way to characterize this next alcohol-related rule, but it, it might not be. It's, uh, it's curious, though. Is alcohol owned by Vimy's property? So let's say, let's say that um, Lerna has a stash of scotch, and we're both Vimy's here in the Muslim land of Bostonia. And Boston, Boston is Bostanistan, let's call it Bostanistan, right? So we're in Bostanistan and, and we're both Vimmies and she's got some, some you know, what I don't drink, so I don't know what's, what's good scotch, but let's just say you have really good scotch and I steal it. And then, um, and then, and then, and then Emily, who's the Qadi, she's the judge in the Muslim lands, is uh, faced with a complaint by Lerna, the Vimmi, says, Unver stole all of my alcohol, and you, the Muslim judge, um, has to now decide whether or not I'm subject to the Quranic, um, uh, the, the Quranic prohibition on theft. Do I get, in other words, my hand cut off? You know, you can say, well, does it rise to the requisite level of property? There's a certain minimum requirement uh, in terms of amount and value. The question, though, is does alcohol have value? Does it, is it what's called mutakawum? So you can imagine, for instance, I'm a heroin dealer, you steal my heroin, am I gonna go to court to say, dude, you, you owe it to me in terms of some sort of compensatory regime, I need to get my heroin back. No, heroin doesn't have legal value in a court of law. Alcohol doesn't have legal value as between Lerna and me. So Lerna's out with respect to one thing, with respect to the Quranic punishment on alcohol. Uh, can, uh, alcohol on, uh, what, the, the Quranic punishment on theft. However, she can still get compensatory liability. The financial value of the alcohol is transferred to her. So what's interesting here is that the dignity of the Quranic prohibition is not applied to what is otherwise an illegal substance or a valueless substance. But financial compensation, which is a, a, a compensatory matter that's subordinate to the Quranic prohibition in terms of gravitas, not to mention scriptural uh, origin and pedigree, that's okay. So notice how on the one hand, this is why I'm not sure this is subordination, but it is problematic. It's certainly not giving Lerna what she wants. It is denigrating property that's valued by her, that she can consume, and that's legally protected for her to consume privately by the contract of protection, but not so protected as to allow her to enjoy the full protection of the Islamic legal regime. Fascinating, I think. So that's alcohol. What you see are then three, three approaches to thinking about 
difference and the way the law manages the difference with respect to the non-Muslim. Now, what about charitable endowments? Well, these are al-Qaf. These were well-known features of Islamic uh, history. Social historians love studying al-Qaf documents. What's interesting to me, though, is trust law is the vehicle by which you could do two things, pass on wealth to your beneficiaries, your heirs in various ways, but it's also a vehicle by which you can create charitable endowments. But what if I'm a Christian or a Jew in Muslim land, so I'm a dhimmi, and I have my wealth that I want to, by which I want to create during my life, or maybe even after death, but that's a different story, um, a charitable endowment to endow a Torah or Bible reading school. Now, on the one hand, if I use the contract argument, I could say, well, is this kind of device, this kind of trust mechanism, the kind of thing their traditions would allow? Sure, why not? It seems like the kind of thing a community would want in order to preserve their community's values and traditions going forward. Except, here's the thing, do we, the Muslim empire, really want these communities to continue with their values in the context of our Islamic public? And so what you find is, in fact, a fight. The Shafi'is, and here I'm, I'm relying on Ash Shirazi, who died in 1083, he says, absolutely not. They can't make these kinds of charitable endowments, no way. It would be like as if you would allow the Sharia to permit them to endow our enemies and provide them arms. In other words, the idea is how can you use the Sharia, the Islamic law, terms around the Al-Qaf, the, the Waqf rules of Sharia, to allow something that is what he would call a sin. The sin is the perpetuation of a false belief as far as Ashidazi was concerned. To, to allow that in Muslim lands is analogous, in his mind, to allowing the non-Muslims to endow a trust, to send armaments to our enemy who will fight us at the border. Suddenly, charity becomes securitized. Charity becomes a threat to the state, but this shouldn't be surprising to us. If you look at most countries, so in the Middle East, for instance, when you think about NGOs, ask yourself, are they allowed to get foreign funding? One. If they're not allowed to get foreign funding, why not? Two, what ministry are they registered with? They're almost always registered with ministries of interior that are in charge of police and domestic security. Why are NGOs subjected to that kind of scrutiny? Why are they subjected to the Ministry of Interior as opposed to the Ministry of Charitable Works? Or Education, or if it's an education charity, why not under a Ministry of Education? When the Ministry of Interior takes carriage of, of NGOs, what you have is a concern about charities subverting the primacy of the state. And we're no different. We have restrictions on charities. We, have alloc we, we see, for instance, if you look at post 9-11 and the Patriot Act, there's concerns around how funds are distributed to certain kinds of charities and others. We too see charities in such a way. So in a way, Ashirazi was just reflecting a concern around the sovereignty of the state. The Hanafis, on the other hand, was like, yes, of course they can. The argument of contract should prevail, as I mentioned before. Uh, the Maliki school is interesting, though, and I want to take a moment to reflect on it. And again, if you're, if you're not a lawyer, bear with me. But you know, for those of you who aren't lawyers, I should tell you right now, one of the most interesting classes in law school that I ever took was tax law. Because tax law, as boring as it sounds and as annoying as the IRS can be, um, tax law becomes a vehicle by which you can organize your society. You, you, in a sense, socially engineer and create incentives for investment behavior, savings behavior. Um, and so what the Maliki School asked is, well, wait a minute. Whether or not they, they changed the question, they said, can a dhimmi who has no heirs bequest his entire estate to the patriarch? So the idea is, if you have heirs, the Quranic, the, there's a Quranic um, provision that provides stipulated shares of your estate to your heirs, except for, for one-third of your estate, which you can bequest more freely. But in this context, we're controlling for that. I say, there's no heirs. I want to take my entire estate and give it to the patriarch who runs, in this case, the Christian community, and I want to give it to him as a charitable trust to support whatever works they're doing. Now, the Malikis said, well, whether this person can do that all depends on how the jizya is paid. 
if the state collects the jizya per capita, individual and per individual, then upon my death, it's losing out its tax income, right? Its tax, its tax, um, its tax coffers will be reduced because I'm no longer paying in because I'm dead. And so, so the worry then is, well, how will I preserve the tax coffers? In that case, no. You cannot, in that case, be, uh, bequest your entire estate to the patriarch. Rather, it escheats to the state. It goes directly to the state. If, however, it's the patriarch who is collectively responsible for the collective tax of the community, then presumably the patriarch is, a, is redistributing that tax liability to us individually. So when I die, the patriarch is still, is still liable for the same amount of tax to the state, but is out. I'm no longer paying in, because I'm dead. So in that case, then the patriarch can take. So in a, in a way, what the Malachis are doing is they're deciding whether or not I can create a trust by adjusting for tax liability. Tax liability in furtherance of the state or the enterprise of governance, whatever you want to call it. So what you see then through charitable endowments is security. The Maliki concern about security and the analogy to, to, um, to arming the, the enemies of Islam. Accommodation, the Hanafi model of contract analysis. And the Maliki public order uh, example through tax law, trying to figure out how do we preserve the, how do we preserve the sovereign. So, well, and then the last, ex I think this is the last example I'm giving you, is, is, in, is in fact uh, an ethic of subordination. Here you do have, no doubt, the notion of subordination. Uh, there is a hadith, um, I don't know if it's a hadith, it's questionable if it's a hadith, it's probably uh, 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 more likely a tradition from one of the companions, but the idea is Islam is superior and not superseded, which sounds like a nice idea, and certainly it, it sort of plays into certain pietistic sensibilities, but for lawyers, it seemed to play into home renovation regulations. Uh, can, if I'm, if I'm a dhimmi and, 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 and learn as a Muslim, and we're neighbors, and I want to make a, I want to renovate my house. I've just finished a renovation. Those of you who know me even know that for four months I've dealt with a basement renovation, so I'm really up on renovation speak right now. But let's say I want to add a second story to my house, and suddenly it's going to be taller than yours. Well, on this rule, I can't do that. Why? Because Islam is superior and not superseded. If I, the them, me, build my house higher than the Muslim learner, well, then she's going to feel bad. And it's going to look bad. And I might look into her house. Who knows where my windows are? Concerns around window placement. In other words, there's no doubt the ethic of subordination is there. But it exists alongside a whole host of other ethics which suggests to me that tolerance really doesn't get to what these rules are doing. These rules, um, I don't think, I, in, in that sense, I think a better vehicle and what I want to gesture at is perhaps something else like rule of law, like governance, like biopolitics. Perhaps these are vehicles in the social science and humanities that might better capture the underlying regulatory impetus of these dhimmi rules but tolerance ultimately hides the underlying power dynamic that I think is better expressed through law. And these questions then, or this questioning of tolerance, then leads me to part two of the talk where I want to think about what does this mean? And you, know, you probably noticed that at various points I tried to make analogies to what we do today, whether it's security and charity or tax law and social engineering and whatnot. Um, to what extent might we see the Vimmi rules as an example by which we can imagine Islamic law as critique. Um, if the Dhimmi rules were premised upon a political ideal of empire, conquest, and expansion, certainly we now live in the modern state, but I'm not sure we actually have left behind our notion of an imperial logic. Uh, contracts were certainly legal presumptions made by a conquered people, made of a conquered people, but we still think in terms of contract. When we think of social contract theory, we think of agreements and uh, pacta sunt servanda still as a, as a fundamental principle of international ordering. Uh, and so how does the difference that's regulated in the fiqh allow us to think more broadly about difference and its regulation in our law? So let me give you an example from the, from, from the historical tradition of Islam. 
uh, the, the case of the Jewish adulteresses, adulterers. And I, and I give you this example, not because I care about the case itself, but I care about certain dynamics of it that will prop up in just a minute. So you have an example during the time of the prophet that's reported in various sources of, of a Jewish community in Medina that comes to the prophet in his, in his adjudicatory role as a, as a judge and says, these two members of our community have adulterated. And so he's like, wow, okay, uh, gosh. Uh, and he says, well, what's the law of your community? Later jurists would say, ah, see, this is the contract to protection in operation, he is using the contract of protection to incorporate their law as part of his analysis, right? So in a sense, it's seen as a kind of foreign law maneuver. Think David Yerushalmi for a second. And so then what happens, so then the Jewish community says, well, we'll bring someone to tell you what the law is. So they bring a young boy who is said to have read the Torah. He reads the Torah, presumably Leviticus. But when he does so, he's said to cover up Cover his hand, he uses his hand to cover up certain passages. So he reads what's above and he reads what's below. And it looks like, according to his testimony of reading into the record, uh, so to speak, that uh, the couple needs to be banished. And so sitting there also with the prophet who was adjudicating, who was a companion of the prophet named Abdullah bin Salam. Now, Abdullah bin Salam was Jewish, converted to Islam, and is heralded as this very knowledgeable member of the Jewish community, but also there's a lot of side literature about him that makes it seem like the Jewish community must really hate him for having done so, uh, but it also valorizes him for having done so. Um, so Abdullah bin Salam, presumably knowing very well the Torah, then tells the boy to lift his hand and says, ha, see, actually that's not true. What's really true is you have to stone them. So it's reading a passage from Leviticus on stoning, and so therefore the prophet then stones him. There you go. So what's interesting, the stoning is, not stoning is terrible, but I'm, that's not the issue here uh, that I'm interested in, luckily. Um, so what's interesting about the story, so first the prophet is sitting in judgment, and the Jewish community, a minority community with their own law, comes to him for adjudication. Uh, so he's then sitting to adjudicate a different legal tradition, his legal other in a sense. If we see the prophet, and this all presumes a robust notion of Islamic law at this time, which we can't historically do, but let's put that to the side for the moment. When the prophet seeks to adjudicate this foreign law, he asks for a foreign law expert. So we then think about, well, what counts as expert evidence of foreign law? The community expert, though, that's brought in, the one expert from the community, covers over the text. This begs the question for me, were these Karaite or rabbinic Jews? We know that in this particular period, there were schismatic Jewish communities in this area, and they, if they were Karaite or Karaite-like, had a strong, would have had a strong, if they were Karaite, would have had a strong fidelity to the text, but, and to the, to the words and, and literal text of the Torah. But if they were rabbinic, we also know that the rabbinic tradition extrapolates from the text, departs from the text in different ways, and provides the rabbis with a great, greater degree of, of license. So if these, were rabbinic, if these were rabbinic Jews, it would actually make sense for the boy to cover that passage if that community's rabbis didn't actually utilize that particular provision of the Bible. If they were Karaite, then it wouldn't make sense of course, it doesn't make sense that you have a boy reading this to begin with, nor does it, if they were rabbinic, make sense that they would be reading from the Torah, but that's, that's, a, that's a complication we'll, we'll deal with in a second. What you have then is, in the context of the prophet's adjudication of foreign law, the possibility of an intra-Jewish contestation of the law and how to do it of its own epistemology. To what extent is the prophetic court, the prophet's court, able to adjudicate that internal dispute sitting outside of it. Think of our current debates on freedom of religion. To what extent do our courts want to adjudicate the orthodoxy or idiosyncrasy of somebody's belief? How often do we resort instead to a subjective sincere test, for instance? So what's interesting then about this particular case is how expertise is invoked, is denied, and here Abdullah bin Salam as the native informant, who we don't know is Karaite or Rabbinic, nonetheless emphasizes to the detriment of the community's representative 
the text over perhaps what might have been interpretation. Why uphold the text? Why preserve the primacy of the text? Is it because the Jewish tradition demands it? Well, we don't know. But certainly we know the primacy of the text feeds the textualism of the Islamic legal tradition and the juristic tradition that is informed by that text. So it also begs a whole host of questions of why Abdullah bin Salam was there. But what I want to suggest is this particular story gives us a lot of really interesting uh, 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 tropes to deal with. Why? Because I want to suggest that Vimy offers us an analytic concept. The adulterous Jews, uh, the, Jew the case of the adulterous Jews, allows us to think about adjudication and the different vehicles by which we, even today, manage difference in our courts. Uh, and so, uh, because I want to suggest that the Vimy legal logic is not all that different than what we see elsewhere. The Swiss bans on minarets, the US legislation banning Sharia, the 20th, uh, 20th century US Supreme Court jurisprudence on Jehovah's Witnesses and their freedom of religion, not to mention the Roma in Europe, all reflect moments, sites where the law must negotiate difference. And to use the Vimy rules as a vehicle for thinking it through, also parochializes what we think of the freedom and the liberty and the liberalism that animates our own law. So I want to use, so in this sense, I'm relying on, on Saba Mahmoud et al's, their work is critique secular, to challenge the idea of critique as secular, which they do, but then ask if critique isn't secular, what would an Islamically driven notion of critique look like? And to do that, I want to suggest, let's look at the veil. You can contest the veil in a whole host of ways. In the West, we contest the veil, for instance, like images like this. An American individual, here our CIA operative, infiltrating the communal automatons of the veiled Muslim class of uh, who knows what, maybe the proletariat, whatever Marxist or whatever interpretation you want. But you can see, in a sense, the veil is doing work there to, uh, to, ins to, to identify us with one character over others. In this particular context, uh, where Quebec was deciding whether or not to ban the veil or the niqab, what you have is Harley Davidson getting in on the picture. Um, you know, to, to each their religion, Quebec's quiet revolution against the church meets Harley Davidson's very noisy hog. Um, and what I find fascinating, again, is how multicultural politics coincide with product marketing, but again, the veil becoming a vehicle of, of, this, of this at a time of, of, of uh, local cultural contests. In France, you have Princess Hijab in France. I don't know what she was doing here, but it looks like political speech, it looks like graffiti art, but she's certainly making a statement of some sort. And this particular tagger, Princess Hijab, is, is well known in the European context. And so what you see, what I call the ninja locker room, also reveals the, the oh, I don't know, oh, it's revealing on a whole host of levels, both literal and figural, figurative, but I'll just move on. Uh, and then here's, of course, the Swiss bands on the minaret. I like to call this the Nakabi Ninja and her missile minarets as if it was like a dancing troupe, right? It sounds like a good dancing troupe or a good, a good singing group. But what's fascinating is that you have this, this, this evil-looking Nakabi-wearing woman with minarets that look like missiles coming out of the Swiss flag, clearly using the veil as a vehicle by which to create a concern around nationalism, national integrity, cultural politics, and so on. And so as we see the veil contested um, in a certain way, we see difference fronted. But when we litigate the veil, what I want to suggest is what we see in the Vimy rules, in the logic of the Vimy rules, is no less present in the way we constitutionally adjudicate issues of rights. So in Sultana Freeman versus the Florida DMV, uh, in 2001, a Florida woman took a driver's license photo wearing her niqab. Later, however, after 9-11 happened, she was asked to come back to take a full face photo and replace the earlier version of her DMV photo with this new full face version. She protested, citing not um, the First Amendment, because by then the Supreme Court had sort of stripped it of a certain content. Many states in reaction um, legislated what are called Religious Freedom Restoration Acts. And on this act, um, what she was trying to say, what she had to argue was that the requirement for her to make a full face photo was a substantial infringement or burden on her religious freedom. 
That was the plaintiff's burden of proof. She had to show somehow that there was a substantial burden on her religious freedom. If she was able to make out that burden, if otherwise, if she fulfilled her evidentiary burden, then the burden would shift to the government who would have to say, okay, fine, yes, we are limiting her religious freedom, but there's a compelling state interest. So already we're, we, we've given up the idea of rights as fundamental. Let's put that to the side. We know that they're not. We know that they're not inviolable. They are, of course, viable in the interest of the state. The court, however, said she never actually met her burden, which means this, the government never had to make its case, never had to articulate why it felt it was necessary for her to actually uncover, which I think is troubling on a whole host of fronts. But, what's, but that's a separate story. What's interesting for us now is to think about why did it decide that she didn't meet her burden? How did they, based on the evidence they received, decide this legal test that she did not meet her burden of showing substantial burden of her religious freedom? Well, they relied on Khaled Abu Fadl, uh, a UCL law professor of Islamic law, who basically said, and they quote him, so I don't know what his affidavit said or his specific testimony, but the court quotes him and then says, it looks like Islamic countries allow women to remove veils for their passports. And so therefore, if they allow women to remove veils for passports or driver's license, we can do this as well. Now that's a strange logic, if you think about it. What are these Islamic countries? There's not, there's not, they're not specified. There's no footnote to legislation. There's no footnote to a Muslim country's domestic regulations, passport requirements. Normally, you would expect a footnote. You would expect some sort of reference to a, a, legal, a legal directive that says, in the case of Muslim women in, let's say, Saudi Arabia who want a driver's license, they have to take off their veil. But of course, women can't drive in Saudi Arabia, which is in part my point here, because the very rule that some countries like Saudi Arabia have to allow women to remove their veils is in the context of a general rule where they're in fact policing veiling, require veiling, have morality police ensuring that veiling occurs. So to remove the veil is in fact an exception from a general rule, and the general rule is the problem. The general rule is the problem because why is a domestic court in Florida subjecting an American citizen to an unstated notion about law by a state not her own? That's the real question. She's invoking Islamic law, the court's invoking state law, it doesn't define the state, but why is the state the relevant vehicle of law here? Why is it the state that matters? Even though we could say, well, it never specifies the state, but even if it did, why is the state the relevant vehicle? And even if it is the relevant vehicle, doesn't it matter that countries like Saudi Arabia and Iran that are associated with the practice that justifies the court's finding aren't in fact democratic, don't in fact respect women's rights? I rarely ever agree with Justice Scalia but when he fights with Justice Kennedy over the role of international human rights law in constitutional jurisprudence, he has a point. His point with Justice Kennedy is, we have a democratic process. Our democratic process requires that any notion of law come through our courts, through our legislative process. The legislative process dictates what the law is. You, the court, sitting here in DC are taking the European Convention on Human Rights and plopping it on American soil. Yes, it's politically nice. Yes, it's politically left. Yes, it accords with your maybe political leanings, but it violates the democratic order. If democracy is that fundamentally substantive to the validity of our laws, why is the Florida court referring to ambiguous Islamic states to adjudicate an American citizen's rights under the Florida Religious Freedom Restoration Act. That's one in terms of the incoherence of this decision vis-a-vis -vis American law. But notice how the move is exactly what the prophet did. The move of reducing her notion of a religious claim to a state legal order is not unlike the prophet adjudicating pursuant to the text of the Jewish community when maybe the community, if it was rabbinic, wouldn't actually do so itself. Let's think, let's think counterfactually. If the rabbinic community bringing the, bringing the adulterers to the prophet were rabbinic, 
we know from halakhic analysis that the Torah is not, in fact, the definitive term of art. It's not, in fact, the starting point. It's decorative of the halakha, but the halakha takes off from it. The, the text opens possibilities, doesn't close possibilities, as a colleague of mine says. But to reduce the analysis in the Jewish adulterer's case to a mere textualism reinstantiates an Islamic legal textualism. And so in the resort by the Florida court to state law, a lot like the, the, the prophet's resort to the text, what we're doing is we're defining the legal other in terms that are familiar to ourselves. And so even though I can say, well, I might side with Justice Scalia on this particular analysis, the fact is, is that, interestingly, for our purposes, the Vimy rules reveal a dynamic of legal analysis. We analyze in ways that are familiar to our legal framework. The grammar of our law will not accommodate the grammar of another law. Sabina Begum versus Denby High School, United Kingdom. A young girl in high school uh, goes to Denby High School, which has a uniform requirement. She complies with the uniform requirement for the first two years, but in the third year, she wants to wear something different. Denby High School had uniforms for girls, one year traditional uniforms. I think there were skirts with shirts, but also it catered to the Muslim South Asian sensibilities of its students by providing the shalwar kameez as an alternative uniform requirement. So the shalwar kameez being sort of like drapey pants and a drapey kind of dress with a headscarf, right? But Shabina didn't want to wear that. She felt that was still too revealing for her sensibilities around modesty and Islam. She wanted to come in a jilbab. It was a bigger cloak of sorts. And, the, and the, the school said, go home and come back when you comply with our uniform requirement. They were very clear that they didn't expel her. They were just not letting her back until she conformed with the uniform requirement. She sued on, and she invoked the European Convention on, on Human Rights, Article 9, which provides religious freedom. However, that same provision in subsection 2 claws back that freedom in the interests of the state, uh, what's necessary for democracy, security, or whatnot. The House of Lords relying on the European court's jurisprudence, decides that certainly there may have been a violation of her religious freedom, but it was fundamentally justified. It was justified, uh, and I won't get into the reasons for justification because it, it takes us in a different direction, but I want to I wanna talk about aspects of the case that are interesting. In every speech by the House of Lords, so the House of Lords, a lot of the members give their own opinions, and in every single opinion articulated on this case, everybody mentioned the fact that there was a concern on the school grounds about extremist Muslims protesting outside school grounds, telling Muslims not to send their kids to secular schools. And every single speech that also, that also then said, oh, but by the way, this isn't relevant to this case. But if it's not relevant to the case, why do you mention it? And I can't help but think that there was a concern uh, linking extremism and violence in the same way that a Shirazi seemed to raise security as a concern around charity. The headmaster of the school uh, was a Bengali woman who was represented by every member of the, of, of, of the court as highly informed in Muslim affairs, very involved with the parents, and in a sense, the very embodiment of the democratic ethos that is the nation through the school. And what she ends up becoming effectively, even though she's named as a party to the case, she becomes the authority of what Islam is, despite other evidence being, being, being led, much like Abdullah bin Salam becomes the native informant in, his, in the case of the adulterous Jews. The shalwar khamis and the jilbab as a site of contestation ethnically. The shalwar khamis ethnically culturally codes South Asian. The jilbab culturally codes Arab. And, and, and I couldn't help but, but wonder, did the court realize that in fact they were, they were implicitly participating in a cultural contest over fashion and identity in the Muslim, in the Muslim environment, arguably. Uh, and again, it reminds me of the Karaite and rabbinic Jewish contest that may or may not have been at play in the seventh century. And what's also fascinating is the way in which the court kept referring to third party rights, i.e. other girls who might be influenced or pressured to wear the jilbab, even though the evidence led by the, uh, by, by the school was very thin. And one of the, one of the court, um, one of the decisions actually was a little bit suggestive that we're not sure how much to believe of this. 
but third party rights became the placeholder for the notion of public well-being, public order, a Denby, a Denby high public space that, re, that went undefined, a kind of public space that Muslims oftentimes invoked when trying to extend rules like, and, ex, and create de derivative rules like public drunkenness. So when we think about these cases of litigating uh, the veil, co contesting the veil, I'm, I'm trying to situate Islamic law as a vehicle for critique, much like Depeche Chakrabarty tries to think about provincializing Europe, much as David Scott tries to raise questions about post-colonialism, uh, in part by suggesting that we need to shift our critique and, and rethink our, our questions. I do so in light of Michael Walzer, who recently, not so recently, published an article about Islamism and the left uh, in Descent magazine. He queried, where is the left with it when it comes to Islamists like, like ISIS? Um, and, and one of the things he writes in there is, you know, on the one hand, the left is very concerned in the politically correct way not to demonize the Muslims, and more often than not criticizes the imperialism of the West. But come on, doesn't ISIS kind of suck? And, um, and he's right, there's a, certainly there is that political correctness. But what's fascinating about the article is that he then says, what the left needs to do is contest ISIS with, with, with Islamic philosophy. And I remember I was at the Institute uh, for Advanced Study last year, and I, and, I, and I said to him, I said, I, I liked your article. I, I understand your point, but it's just the wrong discipline. Why would you go to Islamic philosophy? Do you really think that is the language that ISIS cares about or Al-Qaeda cares about? And it, and it reflected less about how one understands Islam, but it reflected a parochialism of our own academic environment around what counts and doesn't count as a kind of argument. And so when I think about governance, when I think about taking this kind of critique into the world, I'm mindful of, of, a, of, a, of, a, of a case of international child abduction. I'm mindful of time as well, so I want to keep some time for, for questions. But to what extent might we, if we think about Walzer's left and we say, what does that left need to do? In my mind, Walzer's left needs to get comfortable with religion. Walzer's left needs to, on the one hand, critique the Muslim world as it's critiquing the Western Academy. It needs to do what it's doing and find a way to think into the Islamic tradition. But the burden is high. You have to have a considerable sort of epistemic um, capacity to do that, and, and, and it's, it is not an easy one. But I want to give a sense of well, what might that look like if we were to do this, in a sense, double move. And so I want to use international child abduction as an example. I offer this, um, I've been, I've been um, involved in this particular issue as, a, as both a researcher, but partially as an advocate in this ambiguous role as a law professor. Uh, international child abduction is, a, is, a, is, you know, it's pretty straightforward. Uh, here's the example. Husband and wife in the United States get married, they have kids, they divorce. One of the parties, the, let's say the father usually is the assumption, um, has a dual nationality, let's say Pakistan or Jordan, and he doesn't get custody of the kids. He's upset, so he takes the kids, hey, we're going to go to Jordan for a visit. Turns out they move to Jordan. So you have suddenly the father with the kids, you have the mother left behind, presumably with a custody order, and now what does she do? She has to go to Jordan and ask Jordan to return her kids. The problem is Jordan doesn't recognize the foreign enforcement order from the United States. Why not? Because it has its own rules on nationality. It associates the nationality of the children with the father. If the father is Jordanian, the kids are Jordanian, presumed to reside in Jordan as a result. Uh, in terms of custody, if the mother is not Muslim, she's, she's going to be subject to custodial rules that don't really favor her. And so what you have in the international community is a concern around how to get these kids back. Um, the Hague Conference is an organization devoted to private international law when jurisdictions bump up to, against one another. It kind of goes back to the, to the foreign law bills that we talked about earlier. What does a judge do when a case involving foreign law comes into a U.S. court? This is a moment when he, has, he or she has to decide, can I take on this case? Can I assume jurisdiction of this case and adjudicate this other jurisdiction's law on its terms and not my own. And how do I do that? What are the limits of that? And what are the, what's the scope of that? Muslim countries have refused to ratify what's called the Hague Abduction Convention. This is, in a, this is a convention that provides for automatic return of children who are abducted. And they argue that 
Islamic law precludes them from signing on. And so I was asked by the Canadian government to figure out why they are so annoyed by the Hague, protect, the Hague Abduction Convention and what is it about Islamic law that bothers them, that, that makes them bothered by the Abduction Convention. Um, they've been meeting, the Muslim non-signatories and the signatories have been meeting in what's called the Malta process for a number of years. They had three Malta pr process meetings, which utterly failed, and the fourth one's now gonna happen in May. And so the hope is that there's been some movement. I don't know if there has been. But what was interesting to me was to reflect on the rules of custody. If one looks at these rules on custody, certainly you see uh, a, gendered, a gendered dynamic that favors the father in a whole host of ways. But when it comes to custody, what's interesting to me is how do we read these rules? So one of the rules that's interesting has to do with transfer of custody. The argument in the rules is that the mother assumes custody of children up until a certain age, boys until seven, girls until, let's say, puberty or until they get married is usually the example. The question is why? What happens when those kids reach the age? The assumption is automatic transfer to the father. And that's been, a, that's in fact how many Muslim states have read the, read the rules. That's how they oftentimes lit, uh, they legislate those rules. It's certainly how it's been received in the academy. But if we attend to the dynamic of rules in this context as regulating children and their well-being, which is effectively what these rules are trying to get at, the jurists would call it the hadha al the well-being of children, what you see is that what's considered an automatic transfer is actually a moment is actually a rebuttable presumption that, yes, the mother is presumed to lose custody at this age unless the child chooses to stay with the mother. Suddenly, the notion of best interest is informed by the child, him or herself, through the child's voice. Now, that's not all that different than what we do. We oftentimes have to debate when do we, in a court, listen to a child's testimony to determine their best interests. We may not care if, we may not want to listen to a child who's four. I have a four-year-old. I rarely think he actually knows what's in his best interest. I might, he thinks I'm a jerk, but that's okay, because maybe I am. But the point is, is that he's four, really, come on. Uh, but if he was 12 or 14, I still probably won't listen to him, but a court will listen to him. And so, the point is that we can talk about whether seven seems too young or whatnot. We can talk about why the age is. But the minute we begin seeing these rules for what they were doing in the logic of law, we see that, in fact, they're not doing what we think they're doing. We're not actually seeing a gendered division of, well, we are seeing a gendered division of rules and allocations of, of, of role responsibility. But what we see is that what is a gendered allocation of role responsibility is in the service of what's presumed to be, but not expressly stated to be, in the interest of children. And so when we start thinking about these rules as proxies for the interests of children, we have a vehicle by which to unpack them and take away some of the force that comes from the black letter. We also have rules regarding removal, which oftentimes suggested, can a parent remove the child from their residence? In other words, like international child abduction. And what's fascinating is that since jurists actually debated this, this becomes in the international arena the linchpin by which I can go in and say to Muslim countries, look, your understanding of Islamic law kind of isn't where you think it is, and that in fact this historical tradition raised the same concern that the Hague Abduction Convention raises. Does that mean they should automatically sign? Here's the problem. Um, well, here's the problem. If they ratify, if they accede to these conventions, which Morocco has done, they still have to have their accept accession accepted by other signatories. So Morocco has acceded to the 1980 Hague Abduction Convention. The United States has accepted the accession. Canada has not. And the reason Canada has not has to do with issues of competency and institutional, institutional um, heft in terms of the processes. But what really worries me, actually, is that a lot of these countries in the West who are signatories aren't going to accept the accession of, these kind of Muslim countries because really, they don't like the dominant rules on custody. They don't like the gendered implications. They are concerned from a human rights perspective because most foreign affairs ministries have what's called their consular branch, which deals with international child abduction cases, and their human rights branch, which deals with advocating human rights. 
So you can imagine that in a case like international child abduction framed around rules of custody that are themselves framed around gendered roles uh, between men and women, these two branches within a government are gonna fight. The consular officials just want to get the kid back. The human rights folks want, want to get the kid back and they wanna reform the domestic law, right? So in the interest of time, I'm gonna skip some of the stuff that I was gonna say, but one of the ways by which we can think about uh, issues of jurisdiction is, you know, one of the arguments that I, I, I want to suggest is that the conflict between the international legal arena and Islamic law in this particular area is less a substantive matter around gender equality, less a matter of human rights, but more a matter of the inability of the Islamic legal order in terms of the pre-modern period to imagine jurisdictional rules. So here's what I'm suggesting. I'm gonna skip some of this uh, and suggest, so for instance, one of the ways by which you can negotiate this is let's suppose Muslim countries say, we will ratify or we will accede to the 1980 Hague Abduction Convention as Morocco has. We'll also, um, we'll also accede to what's called the 1996 Protection Convention. Under these two conventions, a country like Morocco can say, if we issue an enforcement order around custody, then when someone from Morocco abducts a child from Morocco to Denmark, the Danish court has to respect our domestic enforcement order, the Moroccan enforcement order. That's the 1996 convention. So it's great for Morocco because it protects the sovereignty of their law and legal order when taken abroad. The 1980 convention, however, means that when one of their nationals, let's get, say, goes to MIT to study, falls in love, has a family, marries, divorce, and then wants to come back to Morocco as a refuge with their children, leaving the left behind parent over back in the United States, and Morocco can say, we're not a refuge for you. You took responsibility for yourself over there. Why should we jeopardize our relationship with the United States for your inability to control yourself, manage yourself, or, or, or regulate yourself, whatever, whatever they want to say, right? So it plays to the political context of Morocco to Im impose responsibility on their, on, their, on their own individuals. So the idea then is if they, if they accede to the 1996 and the 1980 convention, they can simply say in any case that comes before our courts that involves either a foreign enforcement order or a set of facts concerning foreign custody or foreign residence, we take those cases out of the application of domestic family law and we place it into a new legal regime. The same judge is instructed not to apply Islamic family law in these cases, but is instead instructed to apply either the 1996 or the 1980 convention. It's a simple technical jurisdictional rule that allows Moroccan judges to maintain jurisdiction of the case, accede to the 1996 and 1980 conventions, but not at all reform their highly gender inegalitarian family law, preserves their family law intact. And my argument is that should work if you want to get the kids back. The challenge then is, on the one hand, for Muslim countries to manage the political context and contest that will come out of, of this particular solution resolution. I think it's manageable. The real question is whether signatories to the conventions, like Denmark, like Norway, like Sweden, are going to accept. If what they really want is a robust human rights reform of Morocco's or Algeria's or Saudi Arabia's domestic law on custody, then we reveal the European conventions on abduction as utterly European, as utterly parochial. So what I wanna suggest is if we use Islamic law as a vehicle for thinking critically about Islamic law and discipline Muslim countries in how they understand their own law, we can help them negotiate how they enter into the international arena in a case like this. But in doing so and relying on the same logic of international law, we force Western countries like Western European countries who have consistently shown a resistance to the Muslim world in terms of uh, using human rights as the bat to beat them with, 
we have to ask them, I said, how committed are you to the universal claims of the Hague Abduction Convention and the 1996 Protection Convention? If you are as, as if you're committed to their universality, you have to accept this model. This jurisdictional rule gives them what they want vis-a-vis -vis children who they want back in their houses, but it will not give them the human rights reform that their human rights divisions want. And if they're not willing to accept the accession of these countries on this ground, you might as well give up the entire enterprise. And that's the challenge. The challenge is the Hague Conference does not want these conventions to be parochialized as European instantiations of a particular cultural attitude around children and best interests of the children. If they want it to be universal, they have to be willing to play this game as well. I'm going to bet you that not all of them will. And that's where I think my hope is the power of thinking of Islamic law as critique can take us. Um, where did I put them? So that's a long way of saying, as I think about concluding, as I think about concluding, and I, I do apologize, I got kind of excited about all the material. I think about, when we think about locate, you know, one of the ways I want to think about the Vimy rules, about tolerance, what I'm really trying to do here is think about Islamic law and the ways by which we can locate where our interest is and where our critique is going. If I think about Walzer's left, I want to ask his left to get comfortable with religion, to understand that in an era of political correctness, it maybe isn't so, it isn't so bad to engage the religious in a way that is also expansive, but also on its terms. So in thinking about the Muslim world, whether it's state or non-state actors, how might we think about that kind of engagement? But also, how might we criticize the Western Academy and the way the Islamic is framed in, uh, to, to preserve and perpetuate our own comfortable categories that, we're, that, 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 that we use all the time? Uh, the virtue of a critical historical legal analysis, to me, is about rooting the questions within a disciplinary frame of law and giving it, and this is the vehicle by which Islamic law has its parochializing power, at least when thinking about uh, Western or international legal orders. Oops, I messed up. Hold on one second, I think I, oh, it died. That's okay. I'm gonna just try to replay this. Where is it? It's restarting, sorry about that. Let me just, um, the last, Two were really, oh, let me just see if I can remember them. Uh, oh yeah, so um, here's where we were. So if, if we think about these two possible uh, observations, I also want to think about fiqh as an epistemic practice that forces us to think about these rules not as in terms of black letter, not in terms of doctrine that applies in a zero-sum game in an all-or-nothing fashion, as if they were a positivist in some way, but rather that they're oftentimes in the service of, whether in the service of some sort of pedagogy, a cultivation of the self, whether they're in the interest of a sovereign, what that sovereign might have looked like in the pre-modern period, in the context of the modern state, in the context of globalization or an international legal order. I also want to suggest that minority litigation, uh, minority, the minorities in general and minority litigation in particular, offers an importantly poignant site where the sovereign enacts itself upon the body of those who are least capable of, uh, of, of responding. I think the most poignant case right now are Syrian refugees as we see them as, as voiceless masses coming to our shores. But I do want to think about tolerance more broadly as a discourse of domination. I want to see law as having an, its own inherent politics, whether it's, it's, uh, it's law of the North Atlantic or Islamic law. And oftentimes, despite our attempt to, ca to, caricature, to, to characterize law as in a liberal frame of protecting individuals from an overreaching government, off, more often than not, law is in the service of a particular imperium of the sovereign. And so rule of law becomes a suspect category in my mind when thinking about the protection of minorities. And in thinking about law in the service of, of a sovereign imperium, I want to think about, you know, examples of this happen to be you know, the Sharia bans in the US, thinking about democracy, law, and the foreign as a vehicle for thinking about how to reinstantiate an American us. Muslim states and the way they use Sharia in, in, international, in the international context to refuse to ratify or ratify conditionally. 
But even in thinking about ISIS as performing the state through law, I mean, if we think about the way their sheer brutality um, has a spectacle, has the element of spectacle that we see as, as, as a feature of, of, of many states that have been, that, that form themselves in a context of violence, but even beyond just simply the spectacle of violence, we see their, their use of Islamic law as a way of showcasing their ability to manage the idea, to see themselves as a, as a taxing authority, as a redistributive authority. Um, but what I find interesting in terms of more recent debates around Paris is, is the, the, the refrain of Paris, of the Paris attacks as terrorist attacks. It doesn't occur, I have not yet seen anyone write about the Paris attacks as belligerent reprisals, belligerent reprisals being a term of art in international humanitarian law as reprisals between states. Uh, to deny ISIS the label of the state is itself to cast cast them in a certain way outside of law. They're out of law, they're outlaws in that sense. But to render them as outlaws is to deny them a certain kind of rationality that we associate it with the state and the law as constitutive of it. And so, just to end, I, uh, my hope is that to focus on tolerance has been, at least for me, my way of suggesting that the law, or at least Islamic law in particular, but law more broadly, has a way of, of uh, of covering certain kinds of political maneuvers that also allow us an opportunity to think of Islam and Islamic law not simply as an object of our attention, but also a vehicle to bring our attention to something that we oftentimes take for granted. So to think of, of tolerance as missing the point is not to deny the, the, the importance of mere tolerance, but rather to deny tolerance having conceptual clarity and coherence and power in a context where to me at least, it seems to be hiding more than it actually reveals. So thank you, and thank you for listening. I went a lot longer than I expected, but I hope that there might be some questions. I apologize for that. Yes, ma'am. When we made a leap into discussing the implications of that for modern rights mm -hmm. of Muslim women in Western context. Mm -hmm. And I, as a historian of the Mies, I, I would love some clarification on what we lose when we make that leap mm -hmm. and that comparison. Uh, that's question A. Yes. Also, perhaps a bit more basic is what do we mean when we say the term Islamic law today? Mm -hmm. uh, what does that actually imply? I, I saw Muslim majority country being thrown up there, but we mm. all, of course, know a lot of Muslim majority yeah. countries do not really engage with Islamic law in their mm. constitute, and you made that point as well, but then I think it got lost with sure. a few examples. So I'd love to hear a bit more clarification about what you are mm. suggesting that term might mean for us sure. today when we, we're throwing it around. Sure, so why, why? Can I suggest something? Yes, please. Can we take enough, if, if please, yes, a couple questions. questions so Absolutely. Thank you so much. It was brilliant and, and fascinating, and I'm not, I, I'm not a scholar of this material. I, I would just be interested in having you elaborate a little bit more on the idea that the law can only see its own mechanisms for legal adjudication. So when it looks to an alternative uh, legal system, it can't see anything other than what it itself um, uses. And so in a sense, the law is always, um, you said law is in the interest of the sovereign, but in a way, if the law is the sovereign, it's always seeing things in its own interest. So anyway, so I saw, saw that as a theme, but I wasn't sure how that was working in the case of the Northern European countries with respect to um, Morocco, because it seemed like their interests, if maybe there's a difference between the Northern European countries and the US, but it seemed as though there's a kind of commitment to individual rights mm -hmm. and the individual as sacrosanct in certain ways. And so getting their, their citizens 
uh, rights protected by getting the abdu ab abductees back uh, seemed like that would be a way to reinscribe its own priorities, but you're saying that that's not what they're doing. So okay. I'm just curious about sure. how that works. Thank you again for this um, really, really, really interesting um, discussion. Two very quick questions. Um, this, this issue of defining them me as the other uh, in, Islam, in Islamic legal traditions, um, and, 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 and defining the me as the non-Muslims. Um, as we all know here, um, as, as, you know, all, uh, as, as the students of Islamic law, Islamic civilizations are, are all aware, um, the me is only referred to certain aspects of those non-Muslims, only Jews and Christians. And the way they are treated are very different from, for example, other non-Muslims um, who happen to exist in Islamic territories um, 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 are, are treated according to legal prescriptions. So in a sense, um, them is the privileged other in a certain way. Um, and, and from the non-privileged other's perspective, to what extent you know, some of the things that you, you stated here um, are applicable? That's one question. Secondly, um, what does exactly mean engaging Muslims or Islamic law in its own terms mean from a leftist point of view, yeah. leftist point of view? What does right. that mean? Um, um, what kind of assumptions, what kind of you know, um, um, attitudes does that mean that we have to take seriously um, um, in, in the Islamic traditions? That's the question. Okay. Can I just add something to it? Because yes, I please. had a very similar question, thinking yeah. about the dimma as the privileged other. Specifically in the context of, I think it would be fruitful to discuss the ISIS abduction of Yazidi women and children, Yazidi being, they are not, cons they are not dummies, right? So I was wondering like what, if you could use that as a case yeah. to make an analogy okay. uh, with great. other things. Right. Yeah. So, so let's um, let's do the let's go let's do the medieval stuff first, then we'll work our way because you know I'll be linear about it. Uh, so thinking about Vimy as the other, uh, you're absolutely right. It was generally understood to be the Ahl Kitab, Christians and Jews. Uh, although what you also find is a debate about whether the, the Zoroastrians or the Majus could, be, could pay the jizya. So what's interesting in this particular context is um, many jurists would say the Majus, who are not Christian or Jew, could pay the jizya, could, be, could come within the Akhtadhimma. However, they couldn't marry, um, they, you, you couldn't marry their women and you couldn't buy their meat which means you couldn't establish kinship net networks and they wouldn't be able to participate in the market of, let's say, meat as a, as a particular market, right? So in one sense, uh, even within this notion of the dhimmi, even if the dhimmi is Ahl al-Kitab, and Ahl al-Kitab is Jewish and Christian, you also see the Majus in a context of expansion into, let's say, Persia. You have this recognition that if you go and you expand into Persia and you only give people two options to fight or be killed or join, no one's going to work the land, right? So there's an economic incentive underlying the preservation of empire as it expands in the context of transforming those conquered into a laboring class. You see also in the uh, in the Fatawa Alamgiriya of, uh, of India under the under the Mughal Empire, you see them talking about whether or not the Abdat al the uh, those who who would be servants of the idols, so idol worshippers, can also pay the jizya. And so you see this expansion of the jizya as a tax, as a vehicle for inclusion. Well, at the, so, it, so even within the jizya framework, you have gradations. So your question then is, what, is, what are we doing with this notion of the privilege, the non-privileged? Um, and what I, what I would want to simply suggest is that in looking at the exceptions, and in looking who is and, include, who is and isn't included, um, at least for me, from a governance perspective, what always fascinates me is the imperative of empire. And you see this in particular with respect to Arab Christian tribes uh, at the time of the early expansions. Were they, were they given the option to pay the jizya or not? Some were and some were not. And those who were allowed to pay, the, the, those who were, who were not allowed to pay the jizya, the argument was, well, they speak the language of Arabic, they have access to the message, they have no excuse. Those who were allowed to pay the jizya, though, were, were, were allowed to do so because 
they were in, in a, they were on the borders in alliance with the Byzantine Empire, and if in this case the Caliph Omar pushed upon them the language of the jizya and and and, and forced them to pay the jizya, uh, they might they might go over to the other side. So in a sense, you see this negotiation over categories and who is and isn't allowed in the service of empire. So there is a way on the one hand we see the jihad and dhimmi rules together as part of a, a part of as part of a, a complex of sorts, a legal complex. But for me what's interesting, and this is maybe the narrow frame that I adopt in terms of governance and empire, is that it's in the preservation, it's in the perseverance and the and the preserve of empire that these rules are are, are doing their work. Um, and so the hierarchy is almost secondary to the service of empire that at least on my reading of them that they're that they're that they're doing um, so uh, what does it mean to to argue from within the Islamic legal framework what's interesting for me is and this is perhaps more a critique of Islamic studies than it is of Islamic law and one of the concerns I have in the in at least if we think about is Let's say let's take ISIS, and let's take let's, so we'll blend this with the Yazidi example, right? So I could argue that taking Yazidis hostage conforms with the jihad rules of the spoils of war, right? Um, but but what's interesting to me is in, in terms of thinking about Islamic law, historically we know that they that the study of it has oftentimes come out of a philological enterprise of the philological discipline that we all know in the field has its own limitations, limitations that I find particularly uh, troubling when trying to understand how law works, what law is in service of. And so for me, to understand the logic of Islamic law is in many ways to bring the discipline of law to what has otherwise up until recently been a, a relatively philological enterprise of study. And so I'm troubled by the philological enterprise. So for instance, to be able to see the rules on custody of children as a rebuttable presumption is, is not the standard reading of these rules on, on, my, on my reading of the secondary literature in this area. And so that's, that's, but that's a reading that comes out of law, not a, not a reading that comes out of philology. And so in many ways, do we then begin to see uh, to read Islamic law in its terms is in a sense to not see it as, as outside of law or as an outlaw, but rather to be in law and therefore to, to, to demand a, a legal disciplinary framework for understanding it. Not simply about let's look to the usul al-fiqh as if that captures it, but rather to think more robustly about developments in legal analysis, legal thinking, legal philosophy. And so those are, are my attempts. So then, in, so again, to, to make sure, I, I, make sure I, I address your question is that, is that you know, one of the ways we could, we could address the Yazidis is either we see this as a, as a fulfillment of the jihadi rules on spoils of war in a context of conquest where women and children are taken slaves. And there is a correspondence, just as there's a correspondence with the decree that I put up on, 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 the, imp on the imposition of the jizya for the Christians of Raqqa. And so, on the, so for me, what I see in terms of ISIS is, is, uh, is what a colleague of mine, Noah Solomon, sees in terms of why are, for instance, you know, in, in, in writing about leaving the Islamic State of Sudan, he writes about, uh, in his forthcoming book on Sudan, he writes about, you know, South Sudan leaving the Islamic State, but also Sudanese leaving Sudan to go fight with ISIS. And there is a sense in which the, the language and the propaganda of ISIS plays to a concern around legitimacy that also is the basis for ISIS's critique of so-called Muslim states. So this, this turn to law uh, and the fulfillment of law is in furtherance of the political vision, the imperium that ISIS wants to perform through its formation of a state, whether or not it, we, want to, uh, we want to allocate it to that, uh, allocate a state to it. So then we get to the, the questions on um, what's lost when I make the move from the dhimmi to the covered Muslim woman. Now, now, one person has argued that what I'm basically doing is saying that the Muslim of Europe is the new dhimmi, which in a sense is probably not inaccurate, um, though I, I wouldn't make the, the, the strict transition. But what I do want to suggest is, um, yes, obviously certain things are lost by, by, by sheer fact of historical context and legal framing. But what's interesting to me is that the interstices of the dhimmi rules is a concern about regulating regulating in a diverse context. And it's bringing that in a context of tolerance talk 
that I think is the gain when I can say to uh, colleagues of mine at the law faculty, for instance, who are very committed to the liberal frame of constitutional governance, that, well, actually, a case like this from the House of Lords reflects the, the you know, not 10th, 11th century jurisprudence that I see, and there's man maneuvers here that are going on. Isn't that funny? They don't find that funny at all, in fact. And I think, to me, that's the gain. That's the gain in my world of law and legal analysis when I'm confronted with a particular vision that casts the Muslim woman, uh, the veiled Muslim woman, as, as something that has to be regulated. And so at least, so I'm, I'm sure that there are things that are lost. I'm more interested in analytically the gain in the comparison um, for purposes of thinking and, and shifting the conversation from tolerance talk to regulation. Um, and so uh, where is Islamic law or what is Islamic law? I mean, this is a, this is a question that is obviously co uh, common in the field of Islamic legal studies. Wa'al Halak has made this p a particular problem for him, uh, one that he's taken very hard uh, stands on. I'm less committed to any particular orthodoxy on it. Um, I'm, I'm neither inclined towards reducing Islam to the text, nor am I simply subjecting it to some ethnographic turn either. I think both maneuvers are unduly reductive, and they play into either removing the Islamic out of history, the philologic tends to reduce it to the text and thereby doesn't place it within history, but the ethnographic in this democratic moment subjects it to this, this, this atomistic enterprise that then it becomes representative um, in problematic ways. So I'm not suggesting that I have the answer to that. I'm just uh, unhappy with the current ones that are given, as well as the critique of the use of the, of, of the term. To me, it's a bit too much language policing, but I do think that in the context of Muslim states, where we do see Islamic law, it's certainly uh, constitutive of their, of their diplomatic logic and the way they engage the international community. And it's one that, at the very least, I take uh, as if I, I assume they're sincere about it. They may be wrong about it historically, but they're sincere about their commitments. And so when I work in that more advocacy role, I, I always assume the sincerity of their positions, their sincerity of their commitment, despite the, the lack of historical sensibility that they have. Um, but then we come to the other, the last question, or it was the second question was asked on, you know, law as seeing itself. This was, this was your question. Um, and so, I, if I understood your question, the question was, was, if I could one expand on that, but how is that playing itself out in these contexts like, the abduction convention. So what's interesting is, is this. So in 1979, during the drafting of the abduction convention, you had Morocco and, and Egypt present. They were the only two Muslim countries present at the drafting. And at that particular time, there was a debate about what's now Article 20, the public order of exception. The idea was, could a country refuse to automatic, so, so what's interesting about the Hague Abduction Convention is that it's a convention that automatically sends the child back, an automatic return provision, but with some exceptions. Uh, some like the grave risk exception, but there's public order exceptions. Now every state has a kind of public order. If you're in the civil law, the civilian system, it would be the order public, which is a, a notion, a very thin notion, but a notion around what is fundamental to the state. And Denmark, the, the Danish representative, uh, and I think looking right at the Moroccan representative, it certainly looks like that from the minutes of the meeting. You have these transcripts, right? And the Danish representative says, well, I can imagine that a jurisdiction that doesn't account for the best interest of the child isn't one that we could send a child back to, you know, and I think, you know, wink, wink, nudge, nudge, Morocco, because, um, you know, Islamic countries were presumed not to account for the best interest of the child as a standard in thinking about guardianship. And so they said in a context like that, we would have to apply our public order exception and not send the child back. But well, what's the public order exception doing? It's reinstantiating the state in its own guise. Morocco, you're not doing what we demand of, of, of in any case like this. Morocco, on the other hand, said, actually, we agree. We would, of course, also want a public order exception. But what's interesting is the more interesting question is, what do you mean by public order? How does that take shape in your jurisprudence? It's a lot like uh, compelling state interest analysis. 
how you define what a compelling state interest is also what circumscribes the scope of freedoms you get to enjoy, let's say under Florida's RIFRA, the Religious Freedom Restoration Act, or in Canada under Section 1. Section 1 is a limiting clause on the enjoyment of freedoms. So that's sort of where I see the fight happening. My suspicion is, is that if, uh, if, for instance, a country like Morocco that's, ratif that's acceded to the 1996 and 1980 convention, if I'm Denmark, and I don't like Morocco's law, the last thing I want to do is give force in a Danish court to a Moroccan enforcement order. So if I'm Denmark, I will not accede to the 1996 convention, so I don't have to be put into the position of having to give force to a Moroccan, to a Moroccan enforcement order if I have that worry about Morocco's family law. So what, what, I begin, what I anticipate, at least, is that if Muslim countries start acceding to the 1996 Convention and the 1980 Convention, it, um, it's going to put countries like Denmark in a position of either only remaining committed to the 80 Convention but not acceding to the 1996, or alternatively, simply not accepting Morocco's accession entirely. And therefore, it treats Moroccan cases as if they're non Hague parties, which subverts the entire Convention order. And in that case, which, is, which I predict is what's going to happen, at least with some countries, that's where I think the convention itself reveals a certain parochialism that undercuts its universality. Does that answer yeah, your question? It did. It's fascinating. Oh, but I was also just thinking that in doing so, Denmark then is also going to deny its own people their rights to their children. Right? Potentially. Potentially, yeah. yeah. So that's what seems like this craziness because it seems as though if, they, if they're seeing their own legal sort of structure as dominant, and, yeah. and in terms of what has to be done, then, yeah. they would, then there's a way in which you'd think, they've got to do this and forget the trying to change yeah. Morocco's culture. Well, That's not going to work. Because they're liberals, right? Right. And so so you're right, in the interest of comedy, right? International comedy, <laughs> not, not with a T, not a D. Uh, you would expect them to, to cooperate, but if, if, if they each treat each other as non Hague states, then when a Danish person you know, abducts to Morocco, Morocco's like, well, I'm going to treat Denmark as a non-Hague because we're not in that relationship. And so the Hague provisions, the automatic provisions, the automatic return, the enforcement orders, none of it matters. And then, and so in that case, I'm not going to subject it to the secondary order of, of judicial, I'm going to subject it to my Islamic legal analysis, which is not going to work for the Danish parent who's left behind in Denmark, and vice versa. So in a sense, it's, it's, the, it's in the interest of comedy you would hope that they would nonetheless accept each other's accession, but it then becomes a test of if Muslim countries don't modify their family law, then it also reveals that this has always been a bait and switch, yeah. right? And that's, that's where the lie is. Lie. That's the lie. That I, and, I, and I hope that I'm wrong, right? I would hope, at least in the interests of children who are abducted, that I'm dead wrong. I want to be wrong on that. I'm not so sure I am, at least from the history that I've seen. With that note, I would like to thank again our guest for this fascinating, eye-opening talk. Thank you so much. I would like to also extend my thanks to my Women and War students, Christina, Isabel, Sophie, Erona. Thank you for being here and uh, sharing this wonderful talk with us.